to the book of Deuteronomy. We are going to go back into the book of Deuteronomy. We have spent the last uh, few weeks in the Psalms, and uh, that, that's been for good cause, but it's time to turn back to this book, and we're going to continue working through this together in this space of time. Lord, will we be back here again to do this in person? Um, I, I will admit that in preparation for this message, as we move back into this book, it's a bit more challenging to do this without you here, um, but God is good. And uh, so we're going we're gonna to move through this together. I just want to remind us of where we've been. So if we go back a, a few weeks as we wrapped up that last message out of Deuteronomy chapter uh, 4, we remember that the people of God were poised at the entrance or on the, on the other side of the Jordan, getting ready to cross over and move into the promised land. Now, they had already spent 40 years in the desert wandering, and then the Lord had given them victory over Sihon, and over Og, these two kingdoms on the other side of the Jordan, a few of the tribes were, were given an initial inheritance over there, some of that land, but the majority of the work was yet to be done. And so in anticipation of them moving into the promised land, the Lord moved Moses to remind the people of the covenant. And this is a call to covenant renewal. Now, the last time we were together, we spoke about two different types of covenant. and It was so important for us to understand that the, that the book of Deuteronomy itself is a covenant and that it is a conditional covenant. So much of what is being presented to these people is, is given to them in an if-then or you do this and I'll do this kind of scenario. The people themselves are the ones who must swear to the covenant. They must keep it. And if they don't and violate the covenant, then there are consequences as we'll see. But underneath of this and through all of this is an unconditional covenant, a covenant that the God of our, that our God, our father made to our, our true father, Abraham, and to his descendants and made a promise to them that was unconditional. It wasn't conditioned upon anything that Abraham had done. It wasn't going to be conditioned upon anything those people had done, nor is it conditioned upon anything that you and I would do. It is an unconditional promise, and it is given to us by the grace of God. And this undergirds the book of Deuteronomy. And so we'll, we'll see some of that this morning as well as we think about that together. So as we look at this, we're going to be talking about this idea of guarding yourselves from idols. Now, I've taken that phrase from actually the last statement of First John. We'll look at that a little bit later, but... This is such a relevant message for you and me today. What I have found as I've wrestled through this time away, even in this kind of time, there are things like this that are uncomfortable, and there, uh, there are fears and anxieties that have uh, even have affected me just in the last few days. And I recognize that the Lord is at work to surface idols in my own heart. He's at work to surface things that I am tempted to trust in, people that I'm tempted to trust in apart from him. And what, a, what an amazing God that we serve, that he would be so gracious and so patient with us to take us through a time like this to surface those things. The people of Israel were about to go into a land where they were going to face all kinds of difficulties, all kinds of fears as they went into war, all kinds of temptations. And the key temptation of their heart was going to be the temptation of idolatry. So it's important that we think about this together. So we're going to look at chapter 4, verses 15 through 31. I'm going to read, if you would follow along while I read. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, out of the midst of the fire, beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. And beware, lest you raise your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. The things that the Lord your God has allotted to all of the peoples under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you. and He's brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance, as you are this day. Furthermore, 
the Lord was angry with me because of you. And he swore that I should not cross the Jordan and that I should not enter the good land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. For I must die in this land. I must not go over the Jordan. But you shall go over and take possession of that good land. Take care, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And make a carved image, the form of anything that the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything, and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you were going over to the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be like left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him. If you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul, when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days, you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. So here's the theme for the message today. Because idolatry is a temptation of the heart, we must be admonished. But because God is faithful to his promises, we can be assured. Idolatry is a fundamental temptation of the heart, as we'll see. And as a result of that, we have to be admonished. The Lord has to warn us. But because God is faithful, because he's a promise-making, covenant-keeping God, we can be assured. So before we move on, let's go to Lord in prayer and ask him to guide this time. Father, I want to thank you again for this opportunity. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. Your word is true. And Lord, you know how much I need you right now. Lord, you know how much we need you in order to hear from you. Holy Spirit, it is you who brings your truth to bear. It is you who makes your word effective. You inspired it. You illuminated it. You apply it. Lord, help us. Help us, I pray right now, to hear from you. Be with me, Lord, I'm broken. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk just a couple, about a couple of preliminary comments before we move into the text itself. First of all, we need to answer the question, what is heart idolatry? Now, for those of you that have been around Cornerstone for a while and have been in various settings and teaching you, you've heard this phrase before. We talk about idols of the heart. But what is heart idolatry? Where does that concept come from? Well, we read in Ezekiel 14, 4, Thus says the Lord God, Any man of the house of Israel who sets up idols in his heart, and then he goes on to talk about the iniquity of that. But that phrase, who sets up idols in his heart, is key to understanding the true nature of idolatry. We're tempted to think of idolatry as pagan ritual worship. Even the, the nation of Israel, most of what they were going to face would have been material manifestations of idolatry. So in other words, they would have gone into a land where the people served physical idols. They bowed down to shrines. They had uh, temple rituals and sacrifices. And all of these material things are probably what we typically think of when we think of idol worship. But what's really going on in idol worship is not so much about the material manifestation of the idol, but what's actually underneath of it in our heart. See, idolatry is actually me seeking satisfaction, protection, help, hope in something other than the Lord. Now, that can be manifested in some physical object, but it may not be. And this is so important for us to understand as we think about the idol worship that they struggled with, because if we get wrapped up in that, 
it, it, it prevents us from understanding how we, too, wrestle with these very things. It may prevent us from hearing the message that we need to hear from the Lord's Word. So what about you and me? What about us? You see, 1 John 5.21 says, at the very end of that letter, little children, guard yourselves from idols. And there's a couple of things I want to point out from this passage. Number one, notice that he says, little children. Throughout the letter that John wrote, he uses this term, little children, to refer to believers. John is talking to you and me as believers. And as believers, he says to us, guard yourselves from idols. I know that if I I go back in my own past, there was a time when I would have been uh, under the assumption that as a believer, idolatry was not a part of my life, that that's something for pagans. But what John is helping us to understand is that even as followers of Christ, we are still tempted toward idolatry and need to guard ourselves against it. And so this is a backdrop, some preliminary work that we needed to do before we move into the text itself. So we're talking about guarding ourselves from idols. So the first thing we want to look at is one warning. One warning. What is this one warning? It is beware, beware, beware. Now, I know that's three words, but it's one warning, right? Beware. It's just that the the emphasis needs to be repeated. Beware, beware, beware. And we see that emphasis in our text. We see it to them, and then we're going to look at it as how it applies to you and me out of the New Testament. But to them, we see this warning in verse 15, chapter 4, verse 15. Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully. Watch yourselves. And then in verse 16, beware lest you act corruptly. And then again in verse 19, beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven. And then down in verse 23, take care lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God. In fact, warnings like this are repeated throughout the whole book. Some 16, maybe 18 different times, specific commands to beware, to watch yourselves, to take care are given. But they're, they're all through the Old Testament. Warnings like this are repeated again and again because those people then needed to hear it. They, they needed to be admonished because their hearts are uh, tempted toward idolatry. But you and I need it too, right? Now, those warnings were justified. The people of Israel did fall away. And they were eventually exiled and were scattered. And they they were exiled and they were scattered because they gave in to the idolatry of the people that they were going in to conquer. They didn't remove completely the Canaanites. They intermingled with them. They married their wives and their their men. and, uh, And they fell into their idolatry. And as a result, they were eventually exiled and scattered. So those warnings were justified. So the warning to them, beware, beware, beware. And the warning to you, the warning to me, well, guess what? It's really the same thing. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 15, beware of the false prophets. And Paul picks up on that in Philippians 3, 2, and says, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Now, Paul is, is talking about real-life teachers in, his, in this community of Philippi, but he's drawing upon what Jesus says Jesus says, listen, many false teachers are going to come. Beware. Beware of these people who bring teachings that are not in line with truth. Beware. Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock, Paul tells the elders from Ephesus. Be on your guard. As elders, be on your guard. For yourselves, elders, you be on your guard, but also be on your guard for the flock because the flock also is tempted. They also need to be beware. And then in 1 John 5, 21, this passage we've already looked at, we look at again. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. So there is this warning to them, and this warning carries over to you and to me. 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 12 is helpful to us in this because Paul actually draws upon the experience of the Israelites in the desert in preparation as they were moving toward the promised land and uses their history and points out that actually what happened to them 
is helpful in understanding for you and me. Follow along while I read verses 6 through 12. Now, these things happened as examples for us, that we should not crave evil things as they also craved. And do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Let us act, let it, nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Do, do you see the warnings to you and to me in this passage? Do not be idolaters. Remember, Paul is speaking to believers in Corinth. Do not be idolaters, nor let us act immorally. Corinth was an amazingly immoral city, but you and I live in a culture of great immorality, nor let us act immorally as they did, nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, nor grumble as some of them did. And listen, I know that right now there is a temptation to grumble. There are many things that are not functioning as they ought. There are many things that are uncertain. There are many things that are challenges. There are struggles. And it's so tempting for us to grumble. But, but do you understand when we grumble that we're actually entering into a form of idolatry that was exhibited by these people that we're reading about in Deuteronomy? And so we need to be warned because these are true, they're true tests for you and me. Paul goes on and he says, now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Do you hear the warning there? What Paul is saying to you and what he's saying to me is, listen, you're tempted to believe that you are above t temptation. You're tempted to believe that idolatry is not a thing for you. But he says, take heed. Don't think that you're invulnerable to these things. Take heed lest you too fall. So he warns us out of grace and kindness. So there's one warning there, beware. And there are two temptations that Paul, or excuse me, that Moses lays out to his people. Two broad categories of temptation in respect to idolatry. Let's look at them. First, the temptation is to misrepresent God, to misrepresent him. So let's look at temptation number one. Let's look at the scripture together. Again, verse, chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. He, Moses begins by saying, Since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb, out of the midst of the fire. Now, notice he says, you saw no form. And, and this is actually the basis for which he's going to say what he does. Since you didn't see any form, beware, lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourself in the form of any figure. You didn't see a form, so beware that you do not make a form of any figure of God. So the first temptation is actually to represent God in a way that is out of keeping with who he really is, to create a form of God that is not like him. Well, what is the nature of God? What is God like? Well, we're told in uh, the verse, uh, a couple of verses preceding our section in verse 12, Moses says, then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. There was only a voice. You saw no form, right? The Lord was communicating something to the people as they were hearing from him. They didn't see a form. They heard words, but no form. John 1.18, Jesus says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. You see that no man has seen God at any time. Now, you might think to yourself, well, but wait a minute. Moses saw God in the burning bush. There were other examples of the people seeing God. Well, actually, what, what they saw were, were representations of God in him helping them 
and an understanding who he is, but they didn't see God. You can't see, no man can see God and live. In fact, this is what Moses is told. When he, when he asks, Lord, Lord, show me your glory. The Lord says, listen, you can't see me in my fullness and live. And so he passes by and gives him uh, something to understand in revelation. But no man has seen God at any time. John 4, 24. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is spirit. God is not man like you and me. God is not corporeal. He doesn't have a physical a being. He's not created. He is the creator. God is spirit. So what's the temptation? You act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of any figure. In other words, you, you take this formless God and you create a form of some figure. And those figures are going to be rooted and grounded in God's creation. Notice what he says next. He says, in the likeness of male or female. And what Moses is going to do right now is he's actually going to take us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. And he's going to work us through the creation. And he's going to point out, and notice the use of this word, the likeness. And that, that's a repetition from Genesis. And he's going to go back to all of these created things and says, listen, don't represent me by things that I've created. Not in the likeness of male or female. Not in the likeness of any animal that is on the earth. Not in the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air. Not in the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground. Not in the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. All of those things are created things. All of those things God created. So what the Lord is saying is, why, why would you ever represent me with something that I've created? And this is a great temptation for them to represent him. This is what the peoples around them did. They formed idols out of things that, that represented their gods. And so Israel was tempted to do this too. We often think when they, when they create the golden calf at, the, at Mount Sinai, and there's a temptation to think that what they're doing there is they're, they're representing a different God. They're turning away from the one true God and, the and then they're worshiping a different God. But that's actually not what was happening. They were representing their God, Yahweh God, with a calf. That's what all of the other peoples around them did. That's what they did in Egypt. They thought that's what they should do with their God. But the Lord says, do not act corruptly in this way and represent me in some way that I am not. So what about you? What about you? What about me? How are you tempted to form God into your conceptions of what you think he should be like? And this is ultimately the problem, isn't it? We want to conceive of God as how we would create him. And you notice that in this misrepresentation, this temptation to idolatry, we actually reverse places with God. We, we want to create him in our image rather than recognizing that he has created us in his. We are tempted to form God in our conceptions and in our thoughts in ways that we think he ought to be. And so especially when we're in difficulty, especially in the midst of trial, especially in the midst of, of challenges that, that, that cause us to struggle, we, we want to conceive of God in ways that make us feel better. They give us the kind of security that we think we need. But do you understand that to conceive of God in any other way than as he actually is, is idolatry. It's to carve an image. Although that image is not physical, you're in your heart carving an image of him that is not truly like him. You are misrepresenting him. Our world is so tempted to do this. We're, we're tempted to do this in the church. Martin Luther, in a debate with a great theologian of his time, challenged this man and said, you think too much of God like man. We make God out to be like us. And this is idolatry. God is not like you. He's not like me. He's far above us. He's far beyond us. And praise God that he is. How was God best represented, though? 
Well, in Deuteronomy 4.12, we read, Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. You heard the sound of words. So the Lord allowed them to hear his voice, but not see a form. Again, in John 1.18, we read, No man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God, who is the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. This is a reference to Jesus. Jesus is the only begotten God, the Christ, and he explains him. He is the perfect image of the one true God. Earlier in John 1.14, we read, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Again, this is a reference to Christ, the incarnate word. But notice it says, the word became flesh. The word, this sound that you heard, this voice that you heard in the desert, this word has become flesh. And now this word is the representative of God because he and only he is the perfect image bearer of the Father. And this is why he can say to the disciples, when you see me, you see the Father because you see the perfection of his character. And we're intended to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. So there were two temptations. The first temptation is to rep- misrepresent God. The second temptation is to misidentify God. To misrepresent him, but then to misidentify him. Again, we read, you act corruptly by making a carved image. But then Moses goes on and he says in verse 19, and beware lest you raise your eyes to heaven And when you see the sun and the moon and the stars, all the host of heaven, you be drawn away and bow down to them and serve them. Things that the Lord your God has allotted to all of the peoples under the whole heaven. You raise your eyes to heaven. In other words, you look up as if to worship God. You look up into the heavens to see God. But what do you see when you do? You see the sun and the moon and the stars and all the host of heaven. You see what appears to have power. You see what gives warmth. You see what controls the gravity. You see the immensity of it all. And then what happens? Well, you bow down to serve and to to worship them. So you identify them as gods. Now you've completely turned away from the one true God and you've identified something else as God. You've identified the sun, which gives heat as God. You've identified the moon, which gives heat. Uh, seasonal turns as God. You've identified other things as God. You've identified things that God has given as God's. He goes on and he says, things that the Lord your God has allotted to all of the peoples under the whole heaven. In other words, you're taking things that benefit everyone. You're taking good things that God has pre- provided to you, and you're, you're identifying those things as God's. And this is what the people of Canaan, the, the people of this land that Israel was going into were doing. They were, they were misidentifying God. They didn't serve the one true God. They served other gods because they believed those other gods controlled the sun and the moon and the stars. They believed those other gods controlled fertility, war, and all of these other things. They misidentified them. And these people going into that land were going to be tempted to misidentify God in this way. But what about you? What about me? What good provisions of God are you tempted to look to as your functional gods? What what I'm saying is this. God has provided all kinds of good things for you and me. Like the sun that gives us warmth. Like the rains that, that bring life to the plant. Like marriage. Like children. Like jobs. All of these things are good God has provided them. But when we look and we see a spouse as our source of happiness, we're tempted to begin to to identify that as my functional God. We're tempted to say, if I'm only married, if I only have a child, if I only had a better job, if I only had a better this or better that, then I would be satisfied. But do you understand what's going on? What what I'm doing is I'm, I'm acting as though That is the source, the foundation, the hope for my satisfaction. I've actually looked away from God and identified something else 
as a God. You and I are not likely to look to the sun. You and I are not likely to look to the moon or the stars and to worship them, but we are tempted in our hearts to look away from God and to have functional gods. So Moses' words speak to you. They speak to me. And in times like this, where there's the, the difficulty of the world pressing in, it actually serves to surface some of these functional gods in your life. When you're experiencing fear, when you're experiencing anxiety, when you're experiencing frustration and anger, these are indications that you are turning your heart away and and looking to something else for your satisfaction. You're wanting something else, believing that that something else, if you just had that, then it would be better. So think about it. What, What would need to change for you not to be afraid anymore? There you have your idol. What would need to change for you not to be anxious anymore? There you have your God. You see, God doesn't change. He is who he is. And if we understand that, then we can rejoice in the Lord always. We can turn away from worry and fear. So guard yourselves from idols. There's one warning, two temptations, and two consequences. Moses lays out quickly two consequences. First, you will perish from the land and be utterly destroyed if you do not obey. What's the consequence? Deuteronomy 4, 25 and 26 tells us, when your father children and children's children and have grown old in the land, if you act corruptly by making a carved image in the form of anything, and by doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord your God, so as to provoke him to anger, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. When you father children and children's children and have grown old in the land, in other words, when you've gotten settled, when you're comfortable, you've been there for a while, things are going well. This is when the temptation is heightened in the midst of comfort is often when we're most tempted to turn away. When you father children, you have grandchildren, things are going well, you've been in the long land, the land long. If you act corruptly, that is, if you practice idolatry, Know this, he says, I call heaven and earth. I call those things that you're making to be your functional gods to witness against you today that you will soon utterly perish from the land. If you turn away from the Lord God, you will perish. You'll be kicked out of the land. And he goes on and he said, you will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. In other words, your nation, your whole people will be utterly destroyed if you turn away from me. The Lord is reminding these people that he's their hope. He's their help. He's their provider. And if they turn away from him under this conditional covenant, there is a consequence. And that consequence is removal from the land. So the first consequence, you'll perish from the land and be utterly destroyed. And the second consequence, you'll be scattered to the nations and given over to worthless gods. We see this in verses 27 and 28. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples. And you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. The Lord will scatter you amongst the peoples. You'll be dispersed. And this is what happened. The northern kingdom of Israel was scattered by Assyria. In fact, so much so that the people were unrecognizable as Israelites. The southern kingdom was eventually carried off to Babylon. And their their way of doing this was to bring people into exile and and bring people from Babylon into into, uh, Jerusalem, scattering the peoples. And you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. They'll be reduced. This is the reversal of the promise to multiply. This is the, the reversal of the blessing I will bless you and I will multiply you. This is the curse. I'll reduce you. And I'll I'll reduce you in all of these nations. And and look, this is what's happened. Going, having gone from being more in number than the sands of the sea to a people that are few in number. And there you will serve gods of wood and stone, the work of human hands that neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. In other words, you're going to be given over. You're going to be given over to the gods that you serve. 
all of these, these gods that they served in Canaan, these gods of wood and the stone, the, the, those gods didn't have ears, they didn't eat, they didn't smell, they didn't live. Even the prophets make fun of these gods. The, the prophets hold out to Israel. They say, listen to Israel, do, do you see what you're doing? In this idolatry, you take a piece of wood and you cut it in half and you use one piece of it to cook your food and the other piece you make an idol out of. That, that, that doesn't hear, it doesn't eat, it doesn't smell, it doesn't do anything. And you're worshiping that. This is worthless. And the Lord says, if you do this, I'm going to turn you over to that. I'm going to turn you over. How do these things apply to you and me? Now, there's a way in which this applies to the church, but there's a way in which, if you see, if we pursue other gods, we'll find their worthlessness. We'll find that they don't satisfy. We'll find that they can never fulfill us. They can never uh, satisfy our souls. In fact, it'll be like chasing the wind. It'll wear you out. They will wear you out. They're worthless. But there's one other way in which this applies to us. Even the church has had a history of expansion, which gives way to complacency, which gives way to decline and dispersion. If you look at the history of the church, the gospel moves into a community, it moves into a, a, a state or a nation, and there's revival, there's expansion. The people are, are uh, energized to take the gospel forward. But then as the church expands with time, they become comfortable. They become complacent. And that complacency, that complacency gives way to a decline and eventually to a dispersion. Yeah, I, I think that there's a way in which we can see this in our own nation. When we look at the vibrance of the church in the United States years ago, when you look at a people that came largely for religious freedom and liberty and the gospel was going forth, I'm, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not suggesting that, that's, that this country was entirely Christian, but there was certainly this great growth, revivals around the country. But, but look, where are we today? The complacency of the church is palpable. The complacency, the, the, the ho-hum approach to the way we worship, and that's given clearly way to decline and may end up in dispersion. Listen, the message to us now is let's wake up. Let's come out of this place of complacency. Let's come out of this place of sleepfulness. Let's wake up and let's go forth and let's carry out the mission that God has given to us and remember the God that we serve. But there's a promise in all of this. There's a promise to his people and there's a promise to you and me. There's one promise. What is that promise? The Lord will keep his covenant. The Lord will keep his covenant. The Lord's promise to his people, he says in Deuteronomy 4, 29 through 31, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Excuse me. He will not leave you, destroy you, or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. He will not forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. The Lord will keep his covenant. That's his promise. That's this unconditional covenant, this unconditional promise that I said sits underneath of Deuteronomy, sits all around Deuteronomy, and that gives you and me such hope. The Lord will keep his covenant. God's character always serves as the foundation for our faith in his faithfulness. It's his character that helps us to understand and have faith that he will, in fact, be faithful full to his promises. He says, he will not forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them, but notice what he grounds it in. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will keep his covenant because of who he is. He's merciful. He's good. Let's consider connections to his character from a psalm. Let's look together at Psalm 111, 1 through 5. We read, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Splendid and majestic is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He's made his wonders to be remembered. 
The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He has given food to those who fear him. He will remember his covenant forever. He will remember his covenant forever. Do you, do you see how that statement is tied earlier to his character again and again and faith in his character? He says, praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. This is an expression of faith, an expression of faith in a God who we can praise, a God that we can give thanks to. Great are the works of the Lord. We've been talking about the need to be meditating upon the character, upon the person, upon the work of God. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. And I would say that they're delighted in by all those who study them. You study the works of the Lord. If you study his character, you'll delight in all of his works. He is good. His righteousness endures forever. That character quality of righteousness. God is righteous. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. That's why he gives food to those who fear him. Because he's who he is. And as a result, he will remember his covenant forever. Our faith, our ability to trust in him is rooted and grounded in who he is. He keeps his promises And we can know that he keeps his promises because we can know him. Faithfulness and steadfast love are his qualities most commonly connected to covenant commitment. His faithfulness and his steadfast love, or another way of saying that is his loving kindness. His, as the Hebrew says, his chesed, his faithful love to his chosen people. A love that is steadfast and that will endure forever. Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love for those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. But it's important that we ask this question. How is it that scripture can so clearly hold out to us the assurance that God will keep his promises while at the same time tying those promises to obedience. Because there's a way in which this unconditional promise of God remembering his covenant seems to be tied to our obedience to it or to his people's obedience to it. We see that in that passage in Deuteronomy 7, 9. The faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. So how is it? that that obedience is tied to God's faithfulness to his covenant? Well, it's because the Lord will keep his people. The Lord will keep his promise to his people. He'll keep his covenant because it's the Lord who will keep his people. The Lord, first of all, has a people. Moses reminds the people they belong to him. In verse 20, he says, But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be a people of his own inheritance as you are to this day. It's the Lord who redeemed you from the people or from the Egyptians. It's the Lord who, who brought you out, who purchased you. You belong to him. The Lord has a people. The Lord has always had a people. And the Lord is faithful to his people. He's always been faithful to his people. Jeremiah 32, 37 through 39 says, Behold, I will gather them out of all of the lands to which I have driven them in my anger, in my wrath and in great indignation. And I will bring them back to this place and make them dwell in safety. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way and they may fear me, that they may fear me always for their own good and for good of their children after them. Do you see? I will, I will, I will, I will. The Lord is faithful to his people. The Lord will keep his people. He will give to them one heart. He will give to them one way in order that they may fear him always. He will. The Lord can promise to keep his promise to his people. The Lord can say, I promise to keep my promise because it is he who promises to keep his people in his promises. He can can promise that he'll keep his promise to you 
because he promises to keep you in his promise. Look at the people's disobedience. Let's quickly review their disobedience. We see in verses 25 through 28, just looking through this, skimming through this, we see these statements. You will soon utterly perish from the land. You will not live long in it, but will be utterly destroyed. The Lord will scatter you among the peoples. You will serve gods of wood and stone. Now, this is a warning to them, but we know that this is what happened. They did perish from the land. They didn't live long in it. They were utterly destroyed. They were scattered. They did serve gods of wood and stone. Look at their disobedience. But look at God's promise. Look at his promise to them. In verses 29 through 31. But from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. From there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. You will. What a promise. You will. He will not leave you or destroy you. Look at the Lord's promises to his people. You're going to return to me. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to destroy you. And that looks ahead and reminds us of Christ's words to us. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you. The Lord keeps his people in his promises by keeping his promise of loving and effective discipline to his people. So the Lord promises to keep his people in those promises, but he keeps his people in those promises by applying loving and effective discipline to his people. And so we see that in our passage. It says, from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him. But when? When you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days. I've been telling you that if you walk away from me, if you turn to these other gods, all of these things are going to happen to you. And for those of you that are my people, when you're in tribulation, I'm going to bring these tribulations, I'm going to bring these difficulties upon you. All these things are going to come to you in those latter days. And then you will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. Then you will return. The Lord is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you. He will bring discipline to you and keep you. This was his promise to his people then. But it's his promise to you and me today. Hebrews 12, 6 and 7 says, For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. John 6, 39 says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given to me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. The Lord keeps his own. Of all that was given to him, he loses nothing. If you belong to the Lord, he will not lose you. He will keep you. He promises to keep his covenant. So here's the conclusion. Listen, beware. Keep yourself from idols. This is a real warning for you and me, a real admonishment because our hearts are tempted to idolatry. But remember, it's God who saves you. It's God who keeps you. And so you can keep trusting in him. If you are in Christ, if you are trusting in the finished work of Jesus, he will keep you. Turn away from idols. Turn away from other gods. Turn away from functional gods and heart idolatry. Remember that it's God who saves you. It's God who keeps you. Keep trusting in him and rest in him. Let's go to the Lord and close in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for the gift of truth. We thank you for your word. It is life and hope and joy to us. Lord, thank you. And we just pray that you would apply it to our lives and remind us of the hope that we have in you and that we can trust you because you are a covenant-keeping God. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.